progress. Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we are going to hear about the pamphlet Political Lesbian Nism, published by Only Women Press, is going to be discussed by Anna Pratt and Sheila Jefferies. Um, so uh, welcome everybody, and I'm really pleased to introduce Sheila and Anna. So over to you two. Hi Sheila, <laughs> nice to meet you. Yes, can I just say it's it's absolutely lovely to be able to talk about this work from so long ago with a young woman now. So uh, this is this is a great pleasure for me. And hello, everyone. I'm, ve I'm very glad to be here. And thank you for all the women that are listening to us. And well, for a start, I think uh, I can talk about how I came to the text. So uh, um, I first came to me, this text came to me in 2018 or 2019. Uh, when I was trying to understand more what this political lesbianism thing was. And at that time, I was still missing a lot of clues to understand the whole thing. And mainly because many feminists that I call equality feminists began to point political lesbianism as like enemies of women. So uh, for them, it was an interesting branch at the theoretical level. And it was interesting to debate, but as something impossible like to put in practice. So they were on our women who are active in groups against queer laws and policies who think that there is no such thing as gender identity, but for some strange reason, they do think that there is a sexual orientation and this cannot be changed. But uh, their main accusation is to say that we are dedicated to reconversion therapies. So my, my main doubts before reading the test and before knowing what I know now were mainly about knowing, let's say, how to categorize political lesbianism. And my questions were, uh, was it a current or a feminism in itself? Was it a political category within a branch? And I think the main problem here in Spain is that in many cases, the information has practically not arrived because of the language gap. And that's it's why perhaps more difficult to access all the information that was generated during the 70s and 80s. So I came to the test and my first thought was if these heteroactivist women read it, they would be furious. So I had a kind of irrational fear of their reaction because at that time, uh, I who was very active in social networks, we could not say things like, oh man, a sexual class or a sexual case that were oppressors uh, without receiving insults and harassment. So uh, I was, uh, it was a text to which I returned assiduously and in 2020, I translated a part of it in my blog. Uh, so it's a text that seemed to me of an incredible courage and lucidity. And I remember in particular a phrase that marked me uh, that says, why all this fuss in our culture about sex? Because it's specifically through sexuality that the fundamental oppression, that of men over women, is maintained. And my perception was that uh, you could be against oppression in all our areas, but not in sexuality, uh, as if that whole terrain had been kept intouchable and somehow maintained a biological, instinctual animal purity. So uh, I think we can go to the first key clue issue of the test uh, that feminists should become political lesbianism. And the main question on which the text is based is whether all feminist women should be lesbians. So uh, maybe we can put the first quote uh, for women to read it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and um, maybe you can explain this definition broadly, Sheila. Yes. Um, now, I think the, 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 the things about this quote that were annoying to some feminists at the time and were annoying to very, very many more now, because it's a very different time, and I will explain that as we talk today, is uh, the, of the idea that, first of all, you can actually change the idea that feminists can become lesbians. I mean, there are some younger lesbians now in particular who say, how can you dare you talk about becoming lesbians? Lesbians are born. They are lesbians in the cradle and you can tell and, and that sort of thing, never wore skirts, all that sort of thing. Um, but of course, at the time, 
Uh, it was a revolutionary time. We believed in social construction. That was the understanding underneath all of our politics, which is that, you know, gender or femininity were socially constructed to keep women down. Women didn't naturally want to do the ironing. Um, and that's, that sexuality was constructed too. There was a lot of sociological texts about how sexuality was different in different cultures uh, and so on. We understood sexuality be so, to be socially constructed at that time. Um, and that was not very controversial. So we did say that women can change, but that was seen as very sort of authoritarian. Um, but we'll talk about why we thought women should change later on. And the definition of a lesbian being a woman who does not necessarily F-U-C-K men, that's one thing I disagree with. I wouldn't use that term now. And indeed at the back, at the end of the, the booklet, we do say we wish we had not used that term. And anyway, women can't F-U-C-K men, it's always the other way around. Um, but one thing that was controversial about that statement is the idea that a woman could be a lesbian in any way without having genital sex with men, uh, sorry, with, with women. Um, uh, this is a huge topic, but the situation is that our society is organized around who has genital connection to whom, and those who don't have genital connection to anybody are generally excluded from the society and not recognized being a spinster, for instance, was always a real, real problem, as I've, I've talked about in my work. So we, I think when we wrote that quote, we didn't think, we thought that women who were totally connected to women, dedicated their lives to women, but didn't necessarily want genital connection with another woman, should be understood under our understanding of political lesbians. Otherwise, where do these women go? There are plenty of heterosexual women who don't, who are seen as heterosexual don't have any connection to men and may not even wish to, but they're seen as heterosexual, part of the heterosexual community. So should the lesbian community only be genital connection when the heterosexual community certainly isn't? So I think that's probably all I need to say about that um, at the moment. I was um, impressed in particular for the woman identified woman because uh, the first time I read it was in the radical lesbians of feminist US group uh, that wrote the manifesto in their 70s explaining this concept of the woman identified woman. And they wrote that <clears throat> she is the one who often at the beginning at an extremely early age acts in accordance with her inner compulsion to be a more complete and freer human being than her society, perhaps then, but certainly later cares to allow her. Uh, and it is the primacy of women relating to women and of women creating a new consciousness and uh, of and with it, each other, which is as the heart of women's liberation and the basis for the cultural revolution. And I think this is as the core also in the political lesbianism text. And I think our freedom depends on that, uh, to see ourselves in new ways to exit compulsory heterosexuality and to be a complete human being. And relating to what you were saying, uh, one of my thoughts about this quote is that a woman may not sleep with men, but to be like fully colonized by their ideas and by their phallocratic way of thinking of their ideologies and so on. So I understand and agree, and we will talk about it later, that sexuality is the fundamental part through which oppression is, is exercised against us. But then I see another part in which there are feminists or even lesbians who do not have sex with men, but they live completely mutilated by masculine ideas. I think, for example, sadomasochism or Marxism and so on. Then about this topic, I choose this second quote. Um, it says, it's something we are supposed to talk about at home and in close and trusted groups of friends and not make political statements about it in the movement. Least our heterosexual sisters accuse us of being woman hating because I feel very related to that. At the beginning when among my group of feminist uh, friends, the idea of political lesbianism appeared and we started to talk about it. We always did it in small groups without anyone being able to read or listen to us and maintaining the patriarchal barrier between the public and the private. And I think this is a sign of the strength of heterosexuality as a political institution, but also in the way we knew that expressing these ideas in public was dangerous in a way that doing so shook the foundations of the institution of heterosexuality. 
Yes, can I just say something here uh, about this quote? This is certainly one of the reasons why the paper was written. Uh, and we talk about it in the booklet, um, that, I mean, one of the questions we were often asked by uh, journalists, for instance, in Women Against Violence Against Women was, are you all lesbians in order to discredit us? And of course, we used to, we trained ourselves in media training to say we have heterosexual and lesbian women in the group. Wasn't true, of course. Um, so we were getting uh, we were getting a lot of questioning about where did our theory come from, our feminism come from, was it because we were lesbians? So we decided at some point we needed to, to speak back and say what we really thought, which was actually quite a dangerous thing to say then, even as it is now, because heterosexual feminists would find this difficult. So one of the reasons we needed to say it was, it was a sort of coming out statement, if you like. We wouldn't keep quiet about this and train ourselves not to speak about it. So, um, yeah, the first point of the book, in fact, is a critique of heterosexuality and why it should be abandoned, which is why the text begins by explaining what sexuality is, is the quote three. Uh, it says it's specifically through sexuality that the fundamental oppression, that of men over women, is maintained. Uh, maybe you can say something more about this. Yes. Now, at that time, the paper was written in 1979, there was more and more criticism of heterosexuality normally in sort of, you know, um, it's it certainly within lesbian and, and feminist circles. Um, we understood there were, there were papers written in the States about heterosexuality being fundamental to the oppression of women. So it's a structural analysis. Heterosexuality is, uh, and sexuality uh, are, are seen as uh, structural and political. So we understood that through sexuality, uh, the oppression of men over women was maintained, not uh, partly through what I talk about in penal imperialism and in other places, which is male sexuality as social control of women, that is keeping women frightened, in home, um, subordinated through the exercise of male sexuality, but of course also through the construction of heterosexuality as a system. And I think we're going to talk slightly more about that in a moment, so I won't necessarily uh, describe that here. Uh, this talking about sexuality was a response to socialist feminists, to liberal feminists. The liberal feminists were all saying at that time, women just needed to be more sexually liberated, do more sex in more interesting ways with men. And that was the revolution. Pornography was seen as fine, uh, sexual expression, and so on. And the socialist feminists concentrated on the workplace and equal pay and so on. We, as uh, revolutionary feminists at that time, and I think you are going to ask me about, or maybe I should explain about radical and revolutionary feminists here, revolutionary feminists concentrated on sexuality. We said that the fundamental structuring force under male supremacy, what kept women controlled, was sexuality uh, rather than any of these other things. So I'll just say a little bit about radical versus revolutionary feminism. In 1977, I wrote a paper for a conference in London, Women's Liberation Conference called The Need for Revolutionary Feminism. Uh, and I said that um, the male supremacy was organized by the control of women's bodies. I said that was fundamental. That's what we needed to talk about uh, for reproductive purposes, but also of course, through sexuality. Um, and it was a packed workshop. Um, a lot of women then started calling themselves revolutionary feminists. They may have been radical feminists before, but they started calling themselves revolutionary feminists. A tendency was created. Uh, lots and lots and lots of women called themselves revolutionary feminists. And I think a distinction between that and radical feminism was because revolutionary feminists saw sexuality as so important, we were pretty much all lesbians, whereas radical feminists were both heterosexual feminists and uh, lesbian feminists. Um, so I think, I think that's where the importance of sexuality came from. Um, and also what the result of our analysis of sexuality, and we started thinking about and writing a lot about sexuality, was that we worked on sexual violence against women. So pornography, sexually violent films and pornography became the earliest focus of our work and continued to be working through rape crisis centers and so on. Yeah, after yeah. reading this book, I understood sexuality like the means of oppression, but before um, feminism, 
I understood heterosexuality like through the lens of sexual orientation. So uh, maybe because I'm I was born in 1995. So this text provides a deeper insight into the political and symbolic implications of heterosexuality. And I think it's not only about particular sexual practices, but about many other institutions that come together, such as patriarchal sex roles, marriage, compulsory motherhood, and the couple, the family. That's why I also choose this other quote, the quote four, that it says, there is very special importance attached to sexuality under male supremacy, when every sexual reference, every sexual joke, every sexual image serves to remind a woman of her invaded center and a man of his power. Uh, I think all social reference to sex has to do with the humiliate, humiliation of women. And in Spanish, for example, the word flirting, which is ligar, uh, it means to tie up. And I, it's also seen in other contexts, like in a football match. I don't know if the same thing happens in English, but in Spanish, when other team beats the other, they say that they have fucked the other team. And sex in patriarchal culture then can only be understood as a relationship of hierarchy, of subjugation, and through compulsory heterosexuality, which are also inculcated with a desire for this subjugation. So what do you think about this quote, Sheila? Yes, at the time that this paper was written and well into the 80s, we had a great deal of discussion on, for instance, uh, sadomasochism, what created masochism in women. Um, we certainly understood that there were values attached to sex. I mean, uh, Andrea Dworkin wrote about this, of course, in, uh, in, in the mid 1980s, which could not easily be got rid of. There were lots of sexual libertarians telling us we could have this sexual revolution of exciting sex using sadism, masochism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, not understanding the way that the whole, whole way of thinking about sex and speaking about sex under male domination was constructed by the oppression of women and by the relations of power. I can remember one day that it became very clear to me when I was sitting behind some young boys on a bus and the boys were talking about, they were only about 10, and they were talking about muff diving, which means doing oral sex to a woman pretty much whether she likes it or not of course and that really struck me and I thought you know there's no way that sex can be disinterred from the hatred of women that lies at the basis of it um, and this was so well understood at the time um, that in the mid-1980s there was a group in America called the Wazis, Women Against Sex which included both heterosexual and lesbian women who said that um, sexual response was so impregnated with the meanings of male dominance and women's subordination that they did not intend to engage in it. Uh, that was very much the discussion at the time. Now, of course, it's hugely worse when in ordinary heterosexual relationships, men are, are strangling women and in some cases strangling them to death. I mean, we didn't have problems quite that great at the time this paper was written. So the idea that everybody should freely and delightfully engage in sex, which was wonderful and liberating when sex was constructed in the maelstrom of this kind of hatred of women uh, was very difficult to imagine. So that's really what we meant by saying that. And it shows the crucial importance of, of sexuality. It's not all sort of delightful dancing about on beaches. Sex itself is constructed as a tool of male domination out of that and expresses those values for both men and women. We can go to the next key issue that is the, the heterosexual couple as the basis unit of the political structure of male supremacy. And um, well, the tool for oppressing, uh, the text says, uh, is heterosexuality. And also the text explains that this tool is exercised primarily through the institution of the couple, which is the quote five. And it says in, in the couple, each individual woman comes under the control of an individual man. It's more efficient by far than keeping women in ghettos, camps or oven sheds at the bottom of the garden. Maybe you can explain this quote. Yes, it should be even sheds, actually, but other than sheds will do for now. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, so what this quote states and what we talk about in the paper 
And what we make very, very clear in the paper, and I think this is the first time that it was expressed quite so clearly in, in the UK anyway, is the, the, the fundamental role of heterosexuality in male domination. Um, because a lot, of, a lot of people, the vast majority of people at that time and certainly now see heterosexuality as a sexual orientation. You happen to be born, probably, you happen to be sexually attracted to men or you happen to be sexually attracted to women. Um, and it's just not something over which you have any control and it's certainly not political. So what we were saying in this quote is that heterosexuality is a, fun, is a fundamental structure of male domination uh, in which uh, men gain control of individual women and those individual women are then expected to service them, produce children from them, for them, and be isolated from other women. Heterosexuality isolates uh, women from other women. Um, and indeed, to go and reach another woman and, and, and have a friendship with another woman, women have to walk through streets in which men may sexually harass them and make their progress difficult. In the home, they're supposed to be safe, but in that home, of course, they are subject to male violence, as, as indeed their children are likely to be. So that the heterosexual unit is the fundamental control unit of male domination. It's the fundamental economic unit of capitalism and male domination. And so heterosexuality is enforced upon women culturally, legally, and in all kinds of other ways. And indeed, if you think about, I mean, at the time in the 1970s, there was huge critique of what was called the heterosexual nuclear family, the idea that that was the way women should live and they should be isolated in individual houses where not only did they have to service and be under the control of a man, but they had to have individual vacuum cleaners, very good for male domination and so on. So the whole architecture of cities and of the, our understanding of the way people live in the world is that heterosexuality exists and that women under the, under the control of individual men, and they're supposed to choose these men very young and then stay with them all of their lives, whatever happens and whether they have any interest in them or not, and so on and so on. You know the story. So in order to have a revolution in a totally different world, we'd have to have different forms of architecture different forms of, of, of the ways in which women lived with each other uh, and, and were able to have children and so on. So we'd have to uh, disinter heterosexuality from this, uh, this liberal understanding of sexual orientation, look politically at how it structures the domination of women. So really that, that is what we were saying. And the, the, as that quote explains, they're not in sheds at the bottom of the garden. As, as black women would be in South Africa, for instance, who are expected to service the household, be, uh, because the myth of romantic love uh, tries to make the way women relate to individual men seem like something natural. Um, uh, so it, it's covered over the, the oppression of women, the exploitation of women, um, the control of women is covered over by this thing called love. Yeah, I think this would perhaps explain why sexual oppression is the most normalized and perhaps the most difficult to identify. And it would be much more evident uh, if we were in concentration camps or in ghettos, or if we have not been inculcated with love for the person who oppresses us. So I think also this text appeals primarily to feminists who are in a heterosexual couple. So I think the text also works to understand the role of women who sustain patriarchy, because patriarchy can only reproduce itself as long as there are uh, women who continue to sustain it. And I think maybe it's difficult to express this idea without being accused of blaming women for what men do to us. But I think it's a view that uh, gives us agency and allows us to think about um, the range of possibilities for freedom that we have rather than thinking that there is no way out of oppression. And I think the, the, um, the phrase that shocked me the most and for which we have been attacked the most, I think, by hetero activists is precisely the one that says that heterosexual women are not the enemy, but collaborators, saying that uh, the quote six, that being a heterosexual feminist uh, is like being in the resistance in Nazi occupied Europe, where in the daytime you blow up a bridge, in the evening you rush to repair it. And maybe you can explain more uh, this 
sentence. Yes. I think that a lot of us who were developing these ideas had a common experience, which was um, we would go to feminist act, uh, activities and meetings. We'd spend the great majority of our lives outside the workplace with other women and then go home to the boyfriend at night. In my case, the boyfriend was called Dave. And then think, why are we here? What do we have in common? What is it about? Um, I certainly felt that. So out of that understanding, I think, comes this quote that we're trying to create a revolution in the daytime and it's entirely with women. And then we're supposed to go home, pour our energies into men and our love into men and not in my case, do the housework. Uh, because I've never been very interested in that, but I mean, do you know what I mean? The servicing of men. Uh, so building men's confidence, building their sense that they are men, which women do emotionally, sexually, and so on. So you try to create the revolution in the daytime, and then in the evening and the time especially given to men um, who are not part of the revolution, because they are not your colleagues in creating the revolution, um, that seen, that was seen, we saw that as uh, pretty uh, counter-revolutionary. So that's, of course, one reason why we uh, were very uh, intent upon abandoning men at the time, so that we were not um, carrying that structure, keeping that structure going in that way. Yeah, I'm sure I have been in heterosexual relationships in the past, and I did feel a complete dissonance when I was leaving the assembly to go home. And it was as if I was like betraying myself as if somehow in the morning, I believe that woman's freedom is possible, but my final destination of the day was to arrive home with my boyfriend, etc. cetera. So uh, one of the questions I asked myself most at the time uh, was whether I was choosing lesbianism women as the second choice or for ideological reasons. Uh, many born this way lesbians attack us with it so uh, I would like to know your thoughts on these issues sorry what was the question more specifically sorry yeah if if I uh, if we were choosing lesbianism uh, or women as the second choice what sorry I'm sorry I, I can't <laughs> question yeah like uh, our first choice is men but men are um, our oppressors, so we, we choose uh, less women in the second choice. Like if, if it were least important because our first choice uh, were men. Ah, yes, yes, I think I see what you mean. Yes, certainly as feminists, we knew that we put women first in everything. Women had to be first. Uh, otherwise, how the hell could we have a revolution for women and how could we, could we create a revolution for women? So we talked about how we could put and should put all of our energies into women. So it didn't seem much, very sensible to us to then put what are supposedly your best energies, which is love and also servicing energies, into men who were the problem rather than the solution. We talked about choosing women who are the solution. But of course, we chose women for far more than they are, that it was absolutely necessary politically, as it still is, because lesbians have been so important in constructing our movement. Uh, we chose lesbians because of the joy. The you know when we were working together politically, as well as when we were at the disco, the joy and the excitement and the energy and the sort of charisma that was created by everybody in that room, if you like, uh, was so joyful and so wonderful uh, that actually s separating out the supposed best energies of love and so on for men made absolutely no sense to us. And indeed at that time, and still I think, we wanted um, heterosexual women, well heterosexual women were leaving men in thousands, in thousands, I mean it was massive, the movement we were creating, but we couldn't understand why women didn't want to do that why they would choose men with whom they had virtually nothing in common. You know, men who would go to the pub in the evening and then to the football. I mean, what the hell was it about? No common interests, um, no common activities, none of the joy of being with women. And yet men, uh, women, many women actually chose them. We couldn't understand that at the time. Uh, these days we don't even have these discussions and we're not even allowed to ask these questions. Um, but I still think they are relevant questions. 
We can go to the next key issue, which is penetration with the next quote. And one of the issues that gave me tools to understand uh, what penetration is that helped me understand what it meant was the idea that penetration does not take place in isolation. That's why I choose this, this quote that says no act of penetration takes place in isolation. It takes place in a system of relationships that is male supremacy and therefore no act of penetration can escape its function and its symbolic power. Maybe you can explain better the symbolic function of penetration. Yes, I mean, I became very, very aware of the uh, function of, of penetration uh, through looking at the works of sexologists and sex therapy manuals throughout the 20th century. And I've written and spoken about that this very much um, elsewhere. The sexologists knew and they actually said very, very clearly that women needed to be penetrated and to have orgasms during the act of penile penetration in order to um, show their obedience to male power and in order to be conquered. Conquered was uh, the term that was frequently used. So it was understood that otherwise women would re resist men. And indeed in the 1920s, a lot of women were from the you know, mid 19th century onwards. And it was understood that getting women to be penetrated and to enjoy being penetrated would control them and throughout the 20th century sexologists and sex therapists have been trying to make sure that takes place but of course they've got a huge job uh, it is a very difficult job because there are many very significant problems attached to the act of penetration not that, i mean there are forms of sexual interaction that do not include penile penetration that obviously are attractive to women and, and in the penile imperialism, which I've just written, uh, quite a lot of heterosexual and older heterosexual women would have been happy to do something else or, or read a book or do nothing at all, because a lot of them weren't interested at all. Um, but penile penetration was absolutely crucial and enforced. Now, the problems with penile penetration as a sexual practice is that it is a reproductive practice. There is no other practice that is a reproductive practice. So it requires contraception. Uh, women's bodies have to be uh, technologized so that they do not uh, reproduce. And that technology, the contraceptive pill and so on, are very problematic in their effects upon women. Um, and if they uh, if the if they are not seen as efficient contraceptors, which is the phrase that was often used in the, the stuff I was reading, efficient contraceptors, uh, then they will become pregnant. They will then have to have abortions and so on. So it's a very unsuitable practice for simple pleasure uh, because it it makes women pregnant. Uh, so that's a very serious problem. And the the problem the another problem is that it's not. Um, necessarily very um, uh, um, pleasurable for women. There was an enormous amount we used to write about and read about at the time about how few women had orgasms through penile penetration. It's not suited to women's pleasure, in fact. Um, it is. It usually takes place in the form in which there is male dominant symbolism and it's the male does the penetration. He colonizes the, the body of the woman and goes inside the body of the woman from a position on top, so symbolically also it's about uh, the subordination of women. It also has a problem in terms of connections with sexually transmitted diseases uh, from AIDS to other sexually transmitted diseases. So it's a practice best avoided even in heterosexuality. And back in the day, in the late 70s, before I became a political lesbian, I gave up penile penetration with my boyfriend because you know, a lot of heterosexual women did because they recognized the problems and thought it was just a good idea to give it up. Um, so there's so many reasons why pen, uh, penile penetration is a, is, is a hopeless and very difficult practice for women and very attractive, a, a problem, a very oppressive practice for women. Um, but of course, women are expected to give the loyalty oath. And this has been done to me, you know, on television, on panels and so on. Heterosexual women will say, but I like or I love F-U-C-K-I-N-G. And that is the loyalty oath. It's absolutely crucial. So, yes, penetration is, is fundamental to male supremacy. And you can see how fundamental it is in, you know, in, in pornography and in the whole culture and, and so on. 
Yeah, the first text I read about penetration, uh, in fact, were by an, any court who denied, for example, the existence of the vaginal orgasm, and another by the Italian feminist Carla Lonzi from her book Let's Pit on Hegel in, from 1970s, in which she talked about how patriarchal culture had imposed on us the erotization of an act that did not correspond to our physiological pleasure, but to reproduction and to extend what this means, the complete colonization of our being. So she said that to have imposed on women a coincidence that does not belong to their physiology has been an act of cultural violence that we do not find in, other, in another, any other type of colonization. So I think that text is fully in line with these ideas explaining how penetration is not necessary for women's pleasure, as well as the dangers involved. And I think the idea that is most difficult to understand is the difference between sex and reproduction, given that patriarchal culture has fused the two, as well as the idea that everything we supposed uh, to like must be good by definition. So um, I think is something that is also dismantled in, in the pamphlet. And in fact, I think there are two ideas that are linked that because the first involves the colonization and eradication uh, of our sexuality through a solely reproductive process such as penetration. And the second one, uh, the colonization and eradication of our pleasure. Uh, through the colonization, through the erotization of male pleasure and power. So uh, we can go to the last part of the text, which are the responses of uh, the text also includes uh, responses of the wires. And um, a, a few years ago, I had the feeling that when I when I uh, found this book, uh, I had the feeling that I have that, that I have found a kind of secret or a key to understanding our oppression. Uh, although I was afraid to say or defend out loud, uh, were you there to publish in in eighty one? So uh, maybe uh, we can talk about the responses and and um, explain. Uh, maybe you can explain what why did you write the paper and what was the atmosphere uh, at that time? Yes, I mean, the, the, the paper was indeed, um, I think, quite, quite revolutionary for its time. Uh, but what's extraordinary now is that it's going everywhere. I mean, it's on a Spanish website and a German website. Obviously, young women are looking at this paper and find this paper very interesting. Um, but at the time, there were uh, mixed responses. Some women absolutely agreed because, of course, they were political lesbians. That uh, all of the ideas in the pamphlet they totally agreed with. Some lesbians uh, were angry about the pamphlet. Um, and uh, this uh, this first quote, I think, it's quite interesting. This is from a woman called Frankie Rickford. She was um, in the Communist Party at the time, and she. Uh, very quickly after, she was a lesbian for a brief period. Now, the, the fact is that some women became lesbians briefly at that time, and she is one of them. And these lesbians uh, went back to men. There were not many of them. I know a handful of women who did this, and she's one of these women. So shortly after writing this response to the paper in which she says, I am a lesbian and I totally disagree with this paper, uh, she went back to men. Now, um, but it's an interesting uh, comment she made. There were many ways in which the paper was seen as, um, you know, unfriendly towards heterosexual women and women in general. She says, it's the first time I've seen feminists deny, directly deny the principle that every woman's experience is real and valid. Now, that's obviously a liberal perspective, although she was in the Communist Party. Obviously, everything that a woman does is not feminist and necessarily a good idea. It's not a good idea that women wear makeup and high heeled shoes, for instance. It's not a good idea that women are sexually exploited in all sorts of different ways, though they will often say, this is my experience and this is completely reasonable. So we do need a feminist critique of the experiences that women have and how women are inducted into those experiences and what those experiences do to construct the oppression of women. So no, uh, it is not the case uh, 
as Frankie says, that as feminists, we should just say, oh, you do that, that's interesting, that must be a good feminist thing to do, and so on. That's really not what feminism is about. But if you do, if feminists do make criticisms of common experiences of women, we are often seen as woman hating. And you know, we really shouldn't do that. It's hostile to make such criticisms. I mean, we know that American feminists who think that it's woman hating to criticize beauty practices, for instance. But it is crucial that we do analyses of all the different forms of the ways uh, in which women are pressed. Yeah, and Frankie Reed for also uh, says that in, the, in her response that her life is filled with irrational and compulsive desires and needs. So I think she follows the line of thought where everything uh, we like is fine. And from this perspective, uh, a truly feminist critique is not possible because it implies, as she says, denying women's experiences. So I think that precisely not making a critique of heterosexuality implies denying the political reality of women throughout our history, a history of submission, but also I think a history of rejection of our oppression uh, and of lucidity of the part of those women and lesbians who managed to get rid of some patriarchal institutions. And maybe we can go to the second response. Yes, this is um, by a, a woman called Sophie Laws, who also became a lesbian, like Frankie did at that time, but remained a lesbian. Um, and this was a, a, a common criticism of us at that time that we were trying to be sort of in the vanguard. Um, we were going to be the most revolutionary of the most revolutionaries, uh, as, she, as she says here. One might think that they were trying to be cadres, professional revolutionaries in the vanguardist Marxist tradition, shining eyes fixed on the glorious future after the revolution, jumpers covered in badges and hearts beating to the rhythm of the right online. Well, of course, that's just a way of being nasty or trying to be nasty. Obviously, if you're in a revolutionary movement, you're going to criticize everything you think needs to be criticized and try to dismantle everything that you think needs to be dismantled. And you will probably do so with vigor. How the hell else are you going to do that? So I, maybe she thought that we should continue discussing these ideas quietly in closed rooms rather than actually putting them out there because of course the pamphlet, the, um, the paper was done for a, a conference originally in 1979. Um, and at that time, what you did was you wrote conference papers to create discussion. And yeah, they were all put on a table at the front of the room. As you walked into the building, you picked up the papers. There was a workshop on the paper. But the point was, um, and maybe this was a, a left tradition, to actually develop theory and create a revolution. So the conference paper was strong and clear and direct. It wasn't mealy mouthed. We stated things in a very direct way. That is what a conference paper was for. And of course, in this case, that's what we did. And this was the response. She also says in the response that um, this text has made many straight feminists feel guilty. And in my opinion, guilt is an emotion instilled in large part by patriarchal femininity that I think it should not stop political criticism or self-questioning. So I also think that this idea that she says of only focusing on the supposedly glorious future after the revolution is not completely true. But in fact, the ideas of the text, I think, um, are very anchored to the, to the context in which they were written and even to the current present. So I think the ideas in the text are practical in a sense to, of uh, like trying to improve the immediate lives of women. Yes, and the interesting thing about making people feel guilty is that I can remember from that time um, being told by another lesbian that the, the, the paper was a real problem because it would stop heterosexual women coming to things, to using feminist businesses and so on. So even though these ideas might have been valid, we should not have put them out 
and it, in fact, the only reason they became very well known is because the ideas were fundamentally important. I mean, if this had not, if this had been the idea simply of some nutty fringe group, uh, they would not have been discussed in the way they were at the time. Many, many, many women's groups were discussing them. Uh, the paper is still seen as significant. I mean, even now, you know, it's being re, uh, recirculated for a new generation. So that suggests these ideas were tremendously important, but there was an enormous sort of pushback at saying that we should only discuss them in closed rooms. I mean, when you think about it, we were just five women doing a conference paper. There were probably about 25 conference papers at that conference, if not more. Um, and yet these ideas have come through. And that in itself is very interesting. And I think that it suggests there is something very, very important and fundamental about these ideas. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, we can go to the next response from Anne Petit, which is very funny. <laughs> yes, this is Anne Petit. Amongst other things, she said, it was the most patronizing, arrogant piece of rubbish I have ever read. Um, now, Anne Petit, it was a heterosexual woman who was very, very uncomfortable about the ideas being de uh, developed by lesbians at the time. Um, what those who are not familiar with the 1970s need to know is that there were mass, there was a massive culture and politics of lesbian feminism at the time. We had huge numbers of groups and organizations and events and so on. And so there were some heterosexual women who found that difficult. I mean, it's not difficult now because there's almost lesbian nothing now. I mean, there's no community politics, there's hardly any groups and so on. So heterosexual women do, do not feel challenged in the way that they did in the 1970s and did feel challenged. And she wrote about um, feeling uncomfortable in the presence of lesbians. I think she talked about it feeling like a, a miasma a lesbian miasma that she found it difficult to deal with in meetings uh, and so on. It's hard to think back to that time, isn't it? Because lesbians are ver so very, very well behaved and scarcely existent in the new movement that is developing now. Yeah, I think the, ang the anger this woman displays in her response, I think, is the usual anger I regularly receive from some straight feminists who have even gone so far as to say that we lesbians were intruders, that we just wanted to divide the movement. And I remember in particular, uh, one of the answers I received from a well-known heterosexual feminist here in Spain, that she says that she valued her friends too much to go to bed with them since she considered, <laughs> she considered herself a sort of alpha female, she said that. And again, seeing sex as something humiliating and too ugly to do with a friend, a woman friend. No, I, I'm completely shocked. I am completely <laughs> yeah. shocked. We wanted to create a whole world of women and there's a woman who thinks that sex is something disgusting. Incredible. We can go to the next one because we don't have many time. <laughs> It says to use the term lesbian in this way is to rob it of any meaning as a description of sexual orientation, preference, or practice. Those of us who were lesbians and suffered all the guilt, hiding, oppression, struggle to come out without the support of a women's movement before we were feminists have good reason to be angry at this denial of what it means to us to be lesbians. The from Joe by Joe Pittman. Yes. And there is a bit of this around now. There's quite a lot of this around. There are uh, lesbians now, particularly those who see themselves as sort of real ones, born lesbians and so on, who accuse um, feminists who create a, a critique of heterosexuality in, a, at all of being somehow, of somehow not being real lesbians. They're not, the, the real lesbians, it's about the sex. The genital connection is what real lesbianism is about. Um, so to expand that understanding is seen as somehow anti-lesbian. But what we were doing then, and what we need to do again, and it's going to be pretty hard now, is we were creating a lesbian universe. 
through our literature and our poetry and our theatre and our music and our events and our festivals and our conferences and our political papers, we were creating a lesbian universe in which lesbians could live in the same way heterosexuals live. The world is heterosexual because that's the way that women, uh, women are controlled and dominated. I mean, how difficult is it for lesbians to actually go to many social events like your work party or whatever, and to never be able to really talk about lesbianism at work or to the kids that you teach at school uh, and all of those things. The world is heterosexual. Lesbians are in it on sufferance and it's very uncomfortable for us and mostly we do not wish to be there. I don't want to go and dance with men at mixed discos and so on. So lesbianism, lesbianism has a history and we were uncovering the history at that time. It has a politics and ethics, a culture. We were creating something very, very, very much bigger than a genital connection. So reducing lesbianism to a genital connection, it, I think is uh, a problem. It is about loving women, putting women first and creating those bonds between women. And also if it's only about a genital connection, as I was saying at the beginning, then where do the lesbian spinsters go? The lesbian spinsters, those who absolutely love women and want to be with women, really need to, uh, exp we need to expand the definition of lesbianism to create a lesbian universe for ourselves. Yeah, I think and this one is the response I heard the most from non-political lesbianism lesbians and I think that the fact of mm, not combining their policies with the way of conceiving themselves means that they keep the spheres of feminism and lesbianism uh, separate so um, maybe we can go to the next one because it's 11 <laughs> Okay, so far I've come across no analysis of heterosexuality by a heterosexual feminist, Paula Jennings. Yes, I think Paula, I've tried to find Paula on the internet. Some, some of you on here may know, I think she's a poet now or has been a poet for a long time. Um, and this is of course, I think a very reasonable criticism. Uh, heterosexual feminists were not at that time talking about um, how their heterosexuality fitted with their politics and advanced the cause of women. Um, and in fact, in 1993, when a Heterosexuality, a Reader was created, the book by Celia Kitzinger, um, they, that they were asking women then, heterosexual women, heterosexual feminists, tell us how your heterosexuality fits. And heterosexual feminists were not talking about their heterosexuality in a political way. And it's obviously, if there is a politics of heterosexuality that needs to be addressed. Uh, we thought then, we thought even I think in the 1990s when Heterosexuality A Reader was published, that there would be lots of critique of heterosexuality, lots of books, lots of research, looking at how heterosexuality operates. Lots of little bits of how heterosexuality operates are looked at, like makeup, like child sexual abuse, and so on. So a lot of bits of heterosexuality are looked at, but not the institution in general. How does it function? How does it operate? And that has never happened. And now, of course, after a huge backlash against feminism, there's nothing like that now. There certainly needs to be much more writing about heterosexuality, how it is constructed, how it operates, and so on. Yeah, I think uh, to this day, I still have not read a good uh, analysis on, or an arc response from heterosexual feminists. And I think all these responses are repeated as a pattern to the responses we receive today, uh, even on social networks or in supposedly feminist environments. Uh, so we can go to the, net, to the final one, the statement from the Only Woman Press Collective. Um, that says we feel that the Leeds paper gave no little or no attention to the weight, denseness and complexity of women's experiences. Yes, um, and I think what I would say here again is what I've said before, which is it was a conference paper, it was short, it was for a conference, it was to get an idea on the table, and it did get that idea on the table. Uh, but we were much accused of, of, of not having the right way of saying things. We weren't being nice enough to women. We weren't loving enough to women in the way that we said it. And our tone was wrong. Our tone, we were definitely tone policed. Our tone was entirely wrong. And I think that the co collective, though they published the, 
the, the paper, did have this feeling that it was just, it was not nice enough to women. We couldn't have covered the weight, densities, and complexity of women's experiences in our three-page conference paper. That was simply not possible. It was about getting a strong idea out there. But certainly the weight, densities, and complexity of women's experiences is a very good idea. Where are all the books on heterosexuality, analyzing how heterosexual women deal with it, how, and how they understand? And so it, that hasn't happened. But I thought that was interesting. It was a common criticism. Not nice, not nice, not nice. Yeah, I think that whenever feminism puts sexuality on the table, uh, always the words it's too complex or it's too dense appear. So maybe we can finish uh, with um, the situation of young lesbians now in, in, the wor in a worldview. <laughs> Yes, I mean, I would like to know from you what's happening around this paper. Are there discussions? Who's discussing it? What women? What are women saying? Are women becoming mm -hmm. political lesbians as, as far as you know? I think that uh, nowadays we can talk about a phenomenon that has been happening on a generalized level in a feminist environments, uh, which is that many young women, including myself, uh, have become lesbians or political lesbians. And I think in the Spanish speaking context, which is the one which uh, I am most in contact, it could be said that it's more common in Latin America than in Spain. So uh, within the feminist circles, I know, I think there has been a tendency towards uh, openness toward these ideas. Uh, although I, I still think uh, that uh, it's still a taboo subject. I believe it is still the source of many conflicts. And in my case, I could categor categorically state that it is a reason to have been deplatformed uh, here in Spain. So uh, I think there is a very internal fear among many heterosexual feminists of being seen as less, femi less feminists because they are heterosexual. And uh, I think that the fact that is a phenomenon that is happening among young women means that there is also uh, like a certain reticence of the part of uh, older heterosexual feminists. Um, and I think that it would be it. And, and speaking about the networks and communities for us, uh, I think the problem is that they do not exist in our immediate environment, but in social networks with women we have met from other countries or other parts of the country. And I think this lack of only lesbian spaces and uh, economic means networks, it's the main cause of why women have ended up returning to heterosexuality or perhaps will do, do it so in the future. Yes. I think I think that's right. I mean, it would be nice to think that this discussion and the fact that young women are reading the paper again after 40 years is going to bring the discussion of heterosexuality back into the center of our feminist movement. I hope that's the case. Um, certainly. And somebody was asking what are the names um, who wrote the pamphlet at the very end of the pamphlet. Uh, there are names. There were five of us. So there was Lal Coveney. There was me, um, there, were, uh, there was uh, uh, Tina, um, there was uh, Valerie Sinclair um, and Al Garthwaite. Um, and, and in fact, uh, uh, um, I was involved in a, a, a significant relationship with one of these women. And when she came down, she ended the relationship, she came down. So, so you could say I was in euphoria when I wrote it in a sense, yes. So when she came down, um, and bringing to London to, to see me with the afterword, saying, do you agree with the afterword? Um, I was just completely distressed because the relationship had ended. So the afterword, I don't necessarily agree with. I couldn't even look at it. I couldn't see what was being written there. You understand that can happen at the end of a relationship. So that was the five of us who wrote it. And I think it's, it's important that we talk about this today because there's a lot of misinformation and I think a lot of important issues like these are being left out as well as being attacked for supposedly dividing feminism among women. And finally, I want to invite all women who are listening to us today to question heterosexuality and all the issues that we have talked today because I firmly believe that it's the path to our freedom. And it's been a pleasure to be speaking with you. 
It's the same. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.